Okay, let's pray together. Our gracious Father in heaven, you are always watching over us. And when we were miserable sinners before, you had a compassion on us, and you sent your only Son, Jesus Christ, to save us. And we really thank you for your love and grace for us. Even though this world is passing away, we have this hope that we will join you in eternal heaven. And there will be no tears, no pain, no sickness, no death, no work. And you are waiting for us because you said, Jesus said he will prepare a great mansion for us. And Lord, thank you so much for placing us in this church, the body of Christ, because with the brothers and sisters, we are working together for your glory. We are praising you. And we are always encouraged and strengthened by your word. So this time we are here again to listen to your word. So please help us to understand your word and strengthen us so that we can continue to serve you as a good children of yours in coming days. Also, Lord, we remember the fifth summer retreat um, going on these days. And we pray for... Uh, the summer riches so that there's no accident and everything will go smoothly and especially there are many people who came for the first time so please help them to understand your love and get saved this time also we have one more English Bible seminar for the seventh summer retreat also we pray for that some Bible seminar too uh, we pray that many people will come and listen to this uh, gracious gospel message so that they can also get saved in that summary tree. So we are just beginning our Bible study now. Until you finish, I commit the rest of time unto your mighty hand. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Okay, let's turn to Matthew chapter 28, verse 20. This is the last verse of the gospel of Matthew. Matthew chapter 28, uh, verse 20. Matthew chapter 28, verse 20. Okay. So Matthew chapter 28, verse 20. Let's read it together. Teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. Um, when we say we are Christians, that means we trust the word of God. Actually, the Bible is full of the promises of God. Right? Even here, we find the promise. What is the promise of Jesus Christ? Lord, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. So what does that mean? Is Jesus here with us now too? Yes? Yes, because he said, I am with you Always, always. For those who are born again, Jesus promised that He would be with us all the time. I believe if you just trust this scripture only, right, then you wouldn't worry about whatever coming in your life, right? Because who is Jesus? He is the God Himself, He is the Creator, right? When Jesus was walking on the water, the disciples were so surprised. But, you know, as a creator, it's nothing. And when Jesus calmed the storms and the wind again, they were so shocked. But as you know, it's, it's nothing for him, right? In our life, there's ups and downs and storms and rain sometimes. But we believe that with Jesus, we are safe. So, Jesus many times rebuked his disciples. Oh, you of little faith. Right? Jesus never rebuked them for like uh, not doing something or uh, not, uh, you know, knowing something. But he always rebuked them because they had a very little faith. Okay? So today, I like to talk about the promises of, of God in the Bible. 
And we have to remember all these promises. Actually, that is our Christian life, actually. Right? Lord, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So just like Jesus promised to be with us all the time, there are so many promises in the Bible. For example, our salvation. How can we be so sure about our salvation? Because it's the promise of God in the Bible. What is the Old Testament? Old Testament is the promises of, of God that He would send the Messiah, the Christ, to save all the sinners. That was the promise in the Old Testament. Right? Moses said, God will send the prophet like me. Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 15, right? So, that promise was fulfilled in the New Testament. And what is the promises in the New Testament? Those who believe in Jesus Christ will have eternal life, and He will be with us all the time, and we just trust His promises. Do you remember the two criminals dying next to Jesus on the, when Jesus was dying on the cross? And... Jesus gave promise to the one who repented. You will be in paradise with me today. Right? Let's turn to Luke chapter 23. Luke chapter 23, verse 43. Luke, Gospel of Luke chapter 23, verse 43. Let's read it together. And Jesus said to him, Assuredly, I say to you, Today you will be with me in paradise. Let me ask you, This criminal, Is he in heaven now? Yes, of course. How do you know? Because Jesus promised. Jesus said, Today you will be with me in paradise. Even though I never seen heaven, even though I never seen this criminal, I still believe that this criminal, the one who repented at the last moment, right before his death, now is in heaven. Right? Why? Because this is the word of Jesus Christ. Jesus never broke his word. He's the same yesterday, today, forever, and whatever he says is true, and whatever promises he gives he keeps his promises right and why we Christians sometimes why we doubt no why we have doubt or why we are worried or why we are concerned or no why we do not trust God sometimes the promises let's remember just like this uh, criminal who was dying next to Jesus we also received this gift, uh, these promises, right? Let's turn to John, John chapter 5, verse 24. John chapter 5, verse 24. John chapter 5, verse 24. Let's read it together. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him, who sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment but has passed from death into life. Yes, most assuredly. In NIV version, verily, verily, Jesus says. Whatever he says, most assuredly or verily, verily is important. And here, I say to you, Jesus is saying, he who hears my word. What is this word? What is this last word on the cross? It is finished, right? It is all paid, paid in full. And if you believe in Him who sent me, God sent Jesus Christ. Do you know what is the will of God? Uh, let's bookmark here and let's turn to John chapter 6, verse 40. Uh, John chapter 6, verse 40. Let's re let me read it. And this is the will of Him who sent me, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in Him may have, what? Everlasting life. And I will raise Him up at the last day. Whoever believes in Him should 
not perish but have everlasting life that is the will of God will that is his intention that is what he's planned long time ago right this is the will of God so let's go back to John chapter 5 verse 24 most assuredly I say to you he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment but has passed from death into life already the judgment was taken by Jesus Christ the punishment for all our sins were borne by Jesus Christ even in Korea there's a law for one crime you will be punished how many times only one time for one crime so you, you stole something so you were sentenced to like a two-year prison after serving two years when you come out of the prison no one will catch you again for that crime right you already served your term in the prison then you don't have to worry about the police or you don't have to worry about anyone coming to you and saying you stole before and you can say yes I did but I already served my term according to the law so for one crime you are punished only one time according to the law right this time, uh, the, during the fourth, fourth uh, summer retreat, I was counseling and there was a lady who studied the law. She understood very well when I said that, right? That's the principle of the law. Therefore, one crime, you only get the punishment for one time, not twice, three times. If you have to be punished three, two times, three times, you should be always afraid, right? After serving in the prison, and you come out again and again. So when Jesus was punished on the cross for our sins, one time the punishment was borne by Jesus, then we don't have to worry about the punishment. And we have moved, we have passed from death to life. I hear sometimes some brother, sister, um, they are worrying about what happens when I sin after salvation. So let me just explain a little bit about that because sometimes there's a confusion about uh, the sin of Christians. So let me ask you, does a Christian sin after salvation? Yes, of course. That's also in the scripture. Let's go back, uh, go to 1 John chapter 1, 1 John chapter 1 verse 10. First John chapter 1 verse 10 First John chapter 1 verse 10 let's read it together if we say that we have not sinned we make him a liar and his word is not in us if any Christian claim that I don't sin at all after my salvation you are making him a liar okay so we sin why? Let me make it clear. The punishment for our sins were paid by Jesus so that we don't have to be punished again. But we still have sinful nature. The sinful nature will be there until Jesus comes again and until He transforms our body to glorious body like Jesus' body after His resurrection. We still have sinful nature. We still hate people. We still become greedy right and even in the bible you see that uh, first corinthians chapter 5 verse 1 there's a one brother who committed some terrible terrible uh, immoral sin right you remember uh, let's turn to first corinthians chapter 5 I, sometimes i don't want to mention it because uh, i'm really ashamed of this brother also but you know the fact is fact so first corinthians chapter 5 verse 1 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1. Let's read it together. It is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you, and such sexual immorality as is not even named among the Gentiles, that a man has his father's wife. There was a brother in Corinthian church. Unfortunately, he fell into temptation, so he had his father's wife, which means he had some relationship with his stepmother. Such a shame, actually. 
So this is why uh, Apostle Paul is saying it is not even named among the Gentiles. Even the Gentiles, the unbelievers, they don't do this. They don't do these kind of things, right? So this Corinthian church had a lot of problems. You have to remember. This Corinthian church, there was a division. There was a division. I'm following Apostle Paul. I'm following Apollos. And they were divided, right? And sometimes there was a dispute among the brethren. So they took each other to the court. And Apostle Paul was saying, How can you take your brother to the court before the human judge? We are the one who will judge the angels. Okay. Anyway, so in this Corinthian church, there was a serious sin. And you have to understand, sometimes this happens because Satan is still working. Satan can never take away our salvation, but he can make Christians stumble, stumble, fall, right? So regarding this brother who committed such a terrible sin, what happened? Verse 5, let's read it together. Verse 5, deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. So from this scripture, you have to learn two things. Number one, even Christians can sin, this terrible sin after salvation. And also number two, what happens? For those Christian who sin after salvation, the serious sin, there will be chastening, chastisement, discipline. So for this brother, what happened? He died actually. So don't be confused. Deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. It doesn't mean that his salvation was taken away. No. It means this. After salvation, we have a we have a protection from God, actually. That's why 1 John chapter 5 says, Satan cannot even touch us. Satan is around us, but he, he cannot do anything to the Christian. Of course, Satan can do something. Satan, Satan can do some harm to unbeliever. Do you know that? In Korea, sometimes uh, at the entrance of some village, there's a big tree and people start worshipping the tree actually bowing down and that happened before and then you know what happens when they try to cut the tree people become sick and then something bad things really happening in the village actually that's that's why they are afraid to cut the tree so what happens for the unbeliever unbeliever even do you know the story of the demon possessed people in the gospel message sometimes they are uh, making them fall into the fire right all kinds of things Satan can do to these uh, demon possessed people too. But for Christians, what happens? We have a protection. So the, the, the evil one cannot even touch us. But for this brother, the, the God's chastening was, deliver such a one for, to Satan. So it means that now Satan can touch him, even kill him, right? So he died. He died, but... His spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. His spirit may be saved. What does that mean? So he died. But where is this brother? Heaven or hell? Heaven. Heaven. Ashamed, actually. Ashamed. Why God killed him? Because he doesn't bring glory to God. God says, you better come home. You better come home. Come home. I think he was very ashamed when he went to heaven, right? But what we know is he's in heaven, no matter what happens. So let me tell you what happens when Christians sin. First of all, we have to confess our sins. Confess our sin. Not to go to heaven, but to restore the relationship with God, right? So let's turn to 1 John chapter 1, verse 9. 1 John chapter 1, verse 9. 1 John chapter 1, verse 9. Let's read it together. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Don't be confused because I know many people use this scripture saying that 
to go to heaven or to be born again, you have to confess your sins. That's not true. Because you have to know the audience of this epistle, 1 John. This 1 John was written for those who are already born again. Why? Verse, uh, verse 3, verse 3, that which we have seen and heard, we declare to you that you also may have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. So when John was writing this epistle, he is writing this epistle to those people who have a fellowship with John, also Father and Jesus Christ. Right? So they are already born again Christians. They are the children of God. So for them, if they commit sin, they have to confess. Why? As you know, after we become God's child, sometimes we uh, make mistakes. Then sometimes the relationship with God becomes like a not so good. And we, don't, we cannot talk to them. Talk to God actually, right? So I think you understand if you think about your relationship with your father, if you do something which father said, uh, you know, don't do that, right? Then... The relationship with the Father is it's not so good and you don't want to talk to Him anymore. That time you have to go to Father and confess your sin, then you can have a good relationship with Father again. Okay? Here, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let me tell you, do you remember before Jesus died on the cross? The Last Supper, Jesus was washing the feet of the disciples one by one. Do you remember? And Apostle Peter always, he says something very interesting, right? Not only my feet, but also my head and hands, please. Jesus said, those who are bathed, they are all clean, right? But the washing the feet, why we have to wash the feet again and again? Because while we are living as a Christian in the world, right? Our feet, our feet is touching this uh, earth again and again, and then somehow our Christian life is not perfect, right? Some dust, some sin, some temptation is there in our Christian life, and then we make a mistake, like uh, our feet becomes dirty. So we have to wash our feet again and again. What this scripture means is when we confess our sins, all these things which happen in our Christian life, the mistakes and sin and this will be cleansed and then God will take us again as if we have no sin at all actually. The relationship, the fellowship will be recovered. Let's turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 verse 23 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23. Let's read it together. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. And may your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved, blameless, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So this is the prayer of Apostle Paul for those brethren in Thessalonican church. And he said, May your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Which means that sometimes, you know, we can be defiled. I mean, blameless means that something can happen, right? So what happens is, with our soul and spirit and body, sometimes we can fall into temptation and we can make mistakes. But he's praying that may God preserve you blameless. Of course, our sins have been forgiven completely. No problem. But even in our life, if we make a mistake, we have to confess our sins. Then, according to 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, God will cleanse us again so that we can have a intimate fellowship with God again. However, if your sin is too serious, as you know, as we saw with the case of the, that brother of the Corinthian church, God will discipline us. And that is called the chastening. Right? Let's turn to Hebrew chapter 12. Uh, Hebrew chapter 12.
Hebrew chapter 12, verse 5. 5 and 6. Let's read it together. And you have forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as to sons. My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. Just like our physical father, our heavenly father also chastens us. What is chastening? Disciplining, actually, right? So verse 8 says, If you are without chastening at all, you are in trouble, actually. Because if you are without chastening of which all have become partakers, then you are illestimate and not sons. You know what this means, right? If any Christian says, Oh, I haven't received any chastening so far, you are in trouble. Because maybe you are not sons. You are not born again yet. That's why God doesn't care. Let me tell you, these days, when you look at uh, what's going on in this world, the evil people, those who are not born again, those who are not Christian, the evil people, wicked people, they are prospering. They are doing very well. They become rich. Some people ask me, why God allow Hitler to kill six million? Right? Because he is an evil man. Why God just let him live like that? Because there's a final judgment. Final judgment. So for those who are not born again, God doesn't discipline them like frequently because there is a final judgment. But for us, Christians, if we do something wrong, if we make a mistake seriously and intentionally, right? If Christian steals something or if Christian in his business cheat on others, Right? or some sexual immorality, then God will chasten that Christian. And we have to be, we have to be happy about this chastening. Right? My son, verse 5, My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by Him. Even if God chastens you, even if God rebukes you, don't be discouraged. Why? Verse 6. For whom the Lord loves, He chastens. That shows how much God loves you. And scourges everyone whom He receives. You know the word scourge? Scourge? Scourge is like a beating. Okay? Beating. Scourge. That happens. Because God loves you. Does God love you? Yes. So, because God loves you. When you are on the wrong way, right? When you are making mistakes, God tried to fix you, correct you, discipline you, right? So that's what happens after, if you sin after salvation. So first, we have to confess our sins, not for salvation, but to have, but to restore intimate fellowship with God again. Secondly, if your sin is too serious, God will chasten you in many different ways, by the way. Many different ways. Right? Maybe there might be car accident, or I don't know. Maybe uh, your, your hand might be broken, or something might happen anyway. But for me, the first thing happening as a chastening to Christian is, you lose peace in your life. Like, losing peace is like a fever. Fever. Your body, when you get sick, the first symptom you have is fever. When you have a cold, right? The fever is there. When you have a fever, you know, something is not right. right? Just like that. For Christians, uh, if you are not obeying God, the first thing happening in your heart is you have no peace. No peace. No comfort. No peace. That is the first thing, actually, like a fever. And when that happens, you have, to, you have to think about, you know, what is wrong in your life, and you have to repent, okay? You have to repent as soon as possible. Anyway, for us, let me just make sure that no matter what happens, discipline might be there, and we might lose our peace in our heart, but still our salvation is secure. Right? Our salvation 
cannot be taken by any other. Let's turn to John chapter 10. John chapter 10. So this is also the promise, right? Uh, John chapter 10, verse 28, 29. John chapter 10, verse 28, 29. Let's read it together. And I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. Do you believe, do you trust this Jesus promise? Yes, then you don't worry about your salvation being lost, actually, right? Here Jesus says, I give them eternal life and they shall never and ever perish. Whenever you see the word perish, that means going to hell, actually. The entering the final judgment and ending up in the eternal hell. That is what perish means. So you will never perish, neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. I am holding you so tight. I am keeping you all the time so no one will snatch you out of my hand. And even Father is holding you so tight. He is greater than all. So you will not you will never lose your salvation. It's also a promise. Okay? When you read the Bible, you will find many, many promises of God, actually. Christian life is trusting His promises. And there's also many promises about, like, um, the reward. You know, reward? You know, God is waiting for, to give us a reward for our work. God saved us, not just to send us to heaven, but also He wants to give us what? Glory. Glory. That is also a promise. Let's remember. The glory is there. If you really believe that promise, then you will work for the glory, actually. Right? Let's turn to 1 Samuel chapter 2. 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 8. First Samuel chapter two verse eight. Let's read it together. He raises the poor from the dust and lifts the beggar from the ash heap to set them among princes and make them inherit the throne of glory. For the pillars of the earth are the Lord's, and He has set the world upon them. Remember. He raises the poor from the dust and lifts the beggar from the ash heap. What does that mean? The poor people, the beggar, nobody cares about them. <coughs> Who were these uh, poor people and beggar? We were actually. We were. You know. As a sinner, we became so miserable. You now we have no hope in this world. We are so poor. We are beggar, but there's a promise that God will lift the beggar from the airship to set them among princes. And you know, Jesus is King of Kings, Lord of Lords, and we are King, we are Lord, we will be among princes. This is the promise. Are you living like a prince or like a beggar? <laughs> beggar. <laughs> This is what I'm saying. When there's a promise that God will raise us up and put us among the princes, that is God's promise, and that will that is what will be happening to us. We are the prince, we are the king, we are the Lord. That is the promise, and God always keeps his promise, right? And make them inherit the throne of glory. Make them Make us inherit the throne. Throne is for the king. Throne of glory. The glorious throne will be there for us. For the pillars of the earth are the Lord's and he has set the world upon them. Why? Why this scripture mentions this? Because right now this earth is not being destroyed, right? This earth is set upon the strong pillars, right? Just like a God is... Uh, protecting this earth and running this earth, he will keep his promises for sure. 
like a pillar. Pillar is very strong, just like that. These promises are the pillars of our Christian faith. Let's turn to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, verse 18. Romans chapter 8, verse 18. Let's read it together. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. The suffering. We suffer this world. But why we Christians rejoice? Because there is a promise. The sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. During the summer retreat, you know, sometimes uh, we suffer, right? It's uh, not so very hot weather, and then it's not as comfortable as your house, by the way, right? You go there, and then even the I heard that there's no hot water, right? So uh, people suffer, and uh, for me, this time I was uh, doing the counseling, and usually <coughs> counseling goes on like uh, three hours, you know, one time, and then the uh, sometimes I don't want to talk anymore. <laughs> but uh, like they come with all kinds of problems and questions, and we have to you know answer all these questions. So that only then, you know, when all the questions are cleared, then they are ready to believe. Actually, oh, is that so? Like, like that, right? Well, one thing I know is I thank God for giving me this chance to 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 preach gospel to the people. First of all, right. Because that means God is using me, right? So I thank God. And then also I remember the scripture. The sufferings of this present world time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Which means that if we suffer a little bit, little bit, God will re reward us greatly, actually, right? For this small, small suffering. Even yesterday, uh, when Brian was listening to the gospel message, many brothers and sisters came and sitting there and then listening together with a, with a uh, praying heart, right? I really appreciate, you know, when brothers and sisters come and sit there. They could relax at home Saturday, but they come and then sit there and then pray for that one soul so that he can understand the gospel message. And I believe for that time you spent with that uh, person who is watching the uh, gospel message, God will reward you, actually. And actually, many Christians will regret, regret that they haven't worked enough, actually. Wow, this small thing, like uh, you come to the church, cleaning the church, right? Or, uh, you know, there are many brothers and sisters who are serving others, right? For small, small work, because Jesus said, if you give a glass of cold water to this little one, I will never forget. Right? And I will reward you. So let's, let's think about this promise, right? 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9. Let's read it together. But as it is written, I has not seen, nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love Him. Yes, what God has prepared for those who love Him, we cannot even imagine. Our eye has not seen, nor our ear has heard, we cannot even imagine what kind of glorious place God prepared for us, actually, right? Sometimes we have to imagine, you know, uh, what God has prepared for us. Let's turn to uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 17. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 17. Again, there's a promise, right? 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 17. Let's read it together. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, 
is working for us a great, a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. For our light affliction, light means it's nothing. We say we suffer, but compared to what Jesus has gone through, it's nothing. Light affliction. You know, Jesus, people were spitting on his face, and he was scourged, and his hand and feet were pierced, and then he was bleeding, right? So, considering what Jesus experienced to save us, it's all light affliction, light. But, for our light affliction, which is but for a moment, again, but for a moment means it doesn't go forever, by the way. It doesn't go forever. And think about it. Let me ask you. How much time you spend to serve God, actually? Most of the time, we are working for our own life to make a living for us, to raise our children. And then we come to church and serve a little bit of time. Not much, by the way. But some brothers and sisters, they don't even want to spend that time. They don't want to join. right? But the promise is... Our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Moses was the one who understood this, and that's why he left the palace. He was the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He's among the princes, prince of Egypt. Have you watched the movie? Right? Moses was the prince of Egypt. But he left everything behind. Why? Because he believed this promise, right? He believed he wanted to suffer for his own people because he believed God's reward is waiting for him. Even though you know, he might have enjoyed whatever this world could afford, but he will have nothing in heaven, right? What about Pastor Paul? Why he was sacrificing so much? Read the book of Acts. One time he was stoned. People thought he was dead. But he rose up again. And you know what he did? He went to the city to preach the gospel again. Okay? Nobody could stop him. He was... Because, again, our work is for the moment. It doesn't go forever. And then, the promise is, God has prepared eternal glory eternal reward for us. If you preach the gospel and save one soul, you will never know what kind of glory is waiting for you. Why? Luke chapter 15. Read Luke chapter 15. If one sheep is missing, then the shepherd, by the way, the shepherd, there's a 99 sheep there, but he didn't, took, he didn't take them to the the, the safe place he just left them in the mountain and he was searching for the one missing sheep because uh, that shows his heart actually it was, it was really finding this uh, missing sheep the lost sheep is so urgent he couldn't even think about this 99 sheep and then he was searching here and there right for one lost soul if one lost soul is being saved, there will be feast in heaven. God will be so happy. That heaven, not only glory, that place is the really perfect place for us. Let's turn to uh, Revelation chapter 21. Revelation chapter 21 verse 4. Revelation chapter 21, verse 4. Let's read it together. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. This is the promise again. What will happen in the heaven? God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Many Christians are crying, you know, because they suffer or because they uh, wanted to preach the gospel to their loved ones. They're weeping. 
they praying and when they go to heaven God will wipe away that all the tears right there shall be no more death nor sorrow nor crying there shall be no more pain for the former things have passed away so if you really trust this promise why you feel down or depressed or why you you know sometimes when I see uh, some Christians no joy okay so depressed so when you go near them you are so depressed <laughs> the depression spreads actually you know that yeah? if you are with someone who is really depressed you also become depressed okay and what does the Bible say? Rejoice all the time. Why? This time we are spending in this world is passing away. Huh? Remember, you know, even for you, your past days, they went very fast, by the way. Okay? Right? It will be just like that until Jesus comes again. It will be soon. He will soon come in. And when we believe these kind of promises, yes, the place God prepared for us is eternal, without any sin. By the way, you know that even our bodies will be transformed, right? Let's turn to 1 John chapter 3, uh, verse 2. 1 John chapter 3, verse 2. 1 John chapter 3, verse 2. Let's read it together. Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. But we know that when He is revealed, we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. When Jesus comes again, our body will be transformed into the body of Jesus Christ, right? We shall be like Him means that just like Jesus went through the world and came to see his disciples, just like that, our body will be like that. Yesterday, uh, I had a dinner with a pastor who is preaching right now. Right? He came from Gunsan Church, and he said that when we read the Bible, actually, or when we listen to the sermon, we don't really put that scripture, the Bible, in our heart. We just hear and then forget, right? We keep hearing and we keep forgetting, right? Because uh, uh, you know, sometimes this is what happens. Uh, have you tried that? You just uh, listen to the sermon and you are doing something, and then you, you when you think about it, you don't even remember what you heard. Actually, you know, it's all just going away, right? If you just hold on to one scripture one scripture and if you really really meditate on it and if you really really make it your own even if there are so much food you have to take it you have to chew it you have to digest it only then it will become your flesh and then you'll be you'll have energy from that food but you know sometimes whatever scripture we hear we don't meditate we don't really think it seriously and then we just forget it. You know? So when you go down after this sermon, just try to remember what you heard. Okay? Some brothers and sisters, you know, as soon as they get out of this room, they forget about it. <laughs> That's why sometimes we are depressed. Okay? We will be like Jesus Christ. And that is great hope, actually, if you really, really trust this promise. Whatever happens in your life doesn't matter, actually. And not only that, when we suffer for God, when we know there will be reward, we can also rejoice, actually. Apostle Paul, when he was preaching the gospel, he was so happy. Even though he suffered, I don't think that he was always depressed. Okay? It was out of joy. You know, he was so happy to preach the gospel. And there's one more promise I'd like to share with you. Let's turn to Philippians. Philippians chapter 1, uh, verse 6. Philippians chapter 1, verse 6. 
Philippians chapter 1 verse 6 Philippians chapter 1 verse 6 Let's read it together Being confident of this very thing that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. For me, this scripture is really encouraging because sometimes I feel like I'm lacking many things. You know? I'm lacking many things as a Christian. Uh, and then, uh, you know, sometimes I'm wondering why God is using me like that. You know? Sometimes we make mistakes. And sometimes we do not meet the expectation of others. Or anyway, many times we feel like uh, we are lacking many things. But when I read this scripture, this is the promise. Being confident, Apostle Paul was confident of this very thing. That he who has begun a good work with our salvation, God started a good work. In our life. Okay? He changed us before we are just living for this world, worldly things, and then for those uh, with no value, actually, no eternal value. But after salvation, God has started good work, good work, and then He will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. What does that mean? Jesus will do whatever it takes to complete the task in our life. So don't worry. Because whenever I read this scripture, it really gives me comfort because I know, you know, I'm not perfect. I'm lacking many things. But there's a promise that Jesus will complete the good work he started in me. Right? It's not me. It's Jesus Christ who will complete it. What I'm supposed to do is just obey and just, you know. As John chapter 15 says, if the branch is connected to the vine, what happens? The branch will bear many fruits. So again, the responsibility is upon the vine, not the branch. For branch, we can just, we should be just connected. Right? We just abide in Him. And this is the promise. If you abide in Jesus Christ, he will complete it. He will perfect it. Not you. But if you are not coming to the church, if you do not join the fellowship, God cannot work for you. Actually. Because here in the church, Jesus is the head. You are the, you are the members of the body. right? That's why we emphasize all the time we should be connected and we should abide in the church so that we receive all the blessing and all the lessons. Whatever we need for our Christian life is given in the church. And we know that God will change you, your heart, your mind, and God will complete the good work in you until the day of Jesus Christ. Don't try to do something for God. But just join the church and fellowship and there you will grow without even your knowing. Okay? This is the promise. Right? And let's turn to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8 verse 26. Romans chapter 8 verse 26. Let's read it together. Likewise, the Spirit also helps in our weaknesses, for we do not know what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit Himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Yes. Likewise, the Spirit, the Holy Spirit also helps. He's helping us in our weaknesses. For we do not know what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit Himself makes intercession for us. What does that mean? The Holy Spirit is praying for us. The Holy Spirit knows exactly in which area we are lacking, what is our weaknesses. He's helping us. Is it true or not? It's true. This is the promise. That's how 
we are living as Christians so far, by the way, without, without the intercession, intercessory prayer of the Holy Spirit, we cannot even live a single day as a Christian. We we'll, we'll stumble again and again, right? Because we are so weak. Verse 27, Now he who searches the heart knows what the mind of the Spirit is because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. Because he, the Holy Spirit, makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. The Holy Spirit, he cares for you, he prays for you, and this is the promise of God. Verse 32, verse 32 Let's read it together. He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? The promise is God is willing to give all things to you. Because he didn't even spare his own son. And some people say, I prayed for money, but he didn't give me. Right? Why? Here, all things means all things are necessary for you. Suppose you have a child, your own child. Do you give everything the child asks for? The child says, before the dinner time, he says, Mommy, give me chocolate. <laughs> then do you give chocolate before the dinner time? Because if you do, they will never eat dinner, <laughs> proper dinner. And then later they will have the, all these rotten teeth and then they have to go to the dentist and then they have to suffer more because, you know, the dentist's office is like a really scary, right? <laughs> anyway, God knows what you need. And really God gives everything you need. Here, he who did not spare his own son, what does that mean? He gave his own son for us without uh, hesitation. He did not spare his son, means that he didn't even hesitate. He didn't even think twice. He just gave his son. So, but delivered him up for us all. How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Yes, this is promise that God will provide everything we need in our life. You might say, I don't have a car I need. Or you might say, we need a bigger house. After spending you know, 10 years in India, uh, I saw many poor people there, actually. There's a place uh, we used to go there uh, near the railroad station. Railroad station, they are having the tent, temporary one, and then they don't have proper water, proper food, you know. Whenever I uh, took Korean mission team there, that place the, where the poor people live, many cried actually. Many was, uh, they, they said, it's too much actually. And then those brother sister says, oh, now I know. I'm really rich. Yeah. I'm really rich. Okay. Whatever you need in your life, God gives you actually. So if you are lacking something, just think that I don't need it. Or in the proper time, due time, God will give me. Okay? Because that's true. If God doesn't give you something, that's because you are not ready. Or it will spoil you, actually. Okay? So, this promise, all this promise, that is really comforting. Verse 33, verse 33, let's read it together. Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Yes, it is God who justifies us. So no one can bring any charge against us. God says we are righteous. Why? No. We worry about what other, other people say about us. Anyway, the Bible is full of God's promises. So when, it, when you read the Bible next time, try to find the God's promise and keep it in your heart and trust Him. Right? And that's how you are strengthened, you are encouraged, and you thank God again and again 
for all these uh, promises, right? God, He never lies. God never lies, and He He always keeps His promise. Let's go to Hebrew chapter ten. Hebrew chapter ten. Verse, uh, sorry, Hebrews chapter 6, verse 18. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 18. Let's read it together. That by two immutable things, in which it is impossible for God to lie, we might have strong consolation who have fled for refuge. To lay hold of the hope set before us. It is impossible for God to lie. That's something God cannot do. Some people say God is almighty God. He can do everything. No. God cannot lie. God cannot sin. Right? So here, it is impossible for God to lie. We might have a strong consolation. This fact that God cannot lie, this gives us a, a strong Consolation, comfort. Why? Because that means everything in the Bible will come true. Uh, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 23. Chapter 10, verse 23. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 23. Let's read it together. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. For he promised is what? Faithful. So let us let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. Without wavering means some people waver. Waver means having doubt and like a not fixed, going this way, that way, right? Moving around. That is wavering. So hold fast. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. We have a hope. We always confess our hope without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. The Bible is God's promises. So let's hold fast unto his promises. Do not waver. Do not waver because he who promised is faithful and he never, it is impossible for God to lie. And all these promises will come true. Very soon. Don't worry. Some people say, why Jesus is not coming? He's not coming yet because there are so many people who are not saved yet. But the day will come one day, right? One day. We are talking about that with the pastors these days. And then when we see, you know, whatever going on in this world, right? It's very near, actually. So that will be coming because He is faithful. So until then, we hold on to all these promises. And let's march on as Christians. Let's pray together. Our gracious Father, thank you so much for giving us all the promises in the Bible. You promised our salvation that when we believe, we'll have eternal life. And this salvation will never and ever be lost. And we also have these promises that you care for us so much and when we confess our sins you will cleanse us again so that we can have a intimate fellowship with Father and Lord you promise to chasten us discipline us when we commit serious sin because you love us and also we know that you prepared the beautiful mansion for us in heaven And there will be no tears, no death, no sickness, no work. And all these promises, Lord, today, we want to remember in our heart without wavering. So, Lord, when we read the Bible, help us to remember all these promises. And we just trust you because you are faithful. So, we always can rejoice with our hope. So today, whatever promise we heard, please help us to remember and hold on to it so that we always live with this hope from 
all these promises. So thank you so much for this time. And as we are having some short fellowship after this, please be with us so that we can have a fruitful fellowship among us. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen.